Hi, best of listeners. Welcome back to another episode of the Syndication School series, a free resource focused on the how to's of apartment syndication. As always, I'm your host, Theo Hicks. So each week, as you know, we air two podcast episodes every Wednesday and Thursday. And those are typically a part of a larger podcast series where we focus on a specific aspect of the apartment syndication investment strategy. And for the majority of these series, in fact, almost all of these series, we offer some sort of document, spreadsheet, template, some sort of resource for you to download for for free to help you in your apartment syndication journeys. All these documents and all of these syndication school podcast episodes can be found at syndicationschool.com. Now we are at the second to last step in the apartment syndication process. We've been going chrono- in chronological order, starting from someone who really has no experience whatsoever with apartment syndications, all the way up to the point where in the last series we discussed how the how to close on your first deal and the process surrounding that. Now, as I mentioned, the second to last step is going to be to asset manage that deal, to execute your business plan, with the last step obviously being selling the the asset. So this is the beginning of that asset management series. It's entitled How to Asset Manage a Newly Acquired Apartment Syndication Deal. It's part one. Um, This will probably be in an eight-part series. Not 100% sure, but it'll likely be an eight-part series because we've got a lot to cover because this is most likely going to be the um, the longest time frame of the entire process, depending on how long you plan on holding the deal for. But this is you know five to ten plus years of of work. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off by going over the top ten asset management duties. So these are kind of high level the the ten things the asset manager is responsible for doing once a a deal is closed on. And if you remember. All the way back to when you were forming your team, uh, this might be you know, the same person who did everything else. You might be a one-man team, or you might have the duties broken apart to the person who raises the capital and the person who maybe underwrites and assets manages the, the deal. So for all of these duties, most of them will be done by the, the asset manager, but some of them will also involve the, the person who's responsible for, for raising capital because... Um, you you ideally the person who actually raised the capital is kind of going to, is going to be the face um, to the investors right you don't want to pull a switcherooski on them and have one person raise all the capital you know build a relationship send them the deal send them the, the the closing email and then all of a sudden some brand new person is talking to them that they either know little about or don't know know at all so we're I'm going to try to get through all ten of these duties in parts one and parts two. So you can move on to other other um, other things in the later episodes. Um, this these first episodes are going to kind of set the foundation for this this series, and then from there I'm going to go into kind of some more details on things that the asset manager needs to think about, as well as things they can do in order to to optimize the the business plan. And speaking of which, the first duty of the asset manager is going to be to implement the, the business plan. So that's going to be the, the main responsibility. And really, I guess everything else kind of falls under the, the umbrella of managing the business plan. So in order to ensure that the business plan is implemented successfully, obviously this starts off by making sure that your your budget from an, extent, from an ex- expense standpoint, so ongoing operating expenses are accurate, that your projected rental premiums are, are, are accurate and this is done before closing um, by having the conversation with your property management company. To learn more about that, make sure you check out the series about underwriting and the series about performing due, due diligence. So at this point, you should have your budget of, okay, this is how much money we plan on spending each month and then each year and then here's how much we expect the, the rents to increase based off of a set um renovation or capex budget again this needs to be included before you close i just wanted to just just mention that again so um you're gonna have this information in front of you and your your goal is to implement the business plan such that you are able to achieve these projections and and assumptions so once you close you're going to oversee this this budget 
So ideally, you are able to gain access to the property management software because you know you don't want to be spending your time inputting these numbers each month. That should be a um, a duty performed by your actual property management company. So at the end of each month, you're going to want to go ahead and access that software or ask your management company to send you the the financials so you can review the monthly financials. Things you want to look at is how um, you know what, what what were your what was your projected budgeted expenses and your projected budgeted income figures and how do those compare to the actual figures? Um, ideally, it's something along the lines of you've got your actuals, um, so you know it's got you know this month January and then on the on the column side. There's a bunch of different, you know, oh, here's all the income, here's all the income factors, here's all the expense factors, and then it's got the numbers, and then next to that, it has either your, your budget, budgeted numbers, or at least a, a variance. So let's say, hey, you know, for, for loss of lease, we projected a, you know, $10,000 loss, but we actually ended up getting a $20,000 loss, and then you have that for, for every single income and expense line item. So obviously what you're looking at are, are any discrepancies from your budget, um, compared to the actuals. If there are discrepancies, you're gonna to want to jump on top of those right away, which is why we're looking at these on a monthly basis. And you're gonna to wanna to work with your property management company to confirm one, what is the cause of this discrepancy, right? So why was that, why was your loss to lease budget way off from the actual loss to lease? And then you wanna formulate a plan to get back on track. Which brings us in to point, uh, do number two, which is to do your weekly performance reviews with your property management company. Now, technically, these could be monthly or quarterly, but the the best syndicators will have weekly performance reviews because if anything were to come up, if there were any issues, not only will you know about them, you know, within a maximum of, of seven days, but you can start thinking of solutions right away as as well. Ideally, those solutions are in place before you notify your investors with a, a new recap email, which we'll get into later on in the, um, the series. So the purpose of these weekly performance reviews is to help you track the progress of your business plan and more specifically track any key performance indicators, um, KPIs that, that you and or your property management company has set and decided to, to track. So for, for Joe's business, uh, he has the, the, these KPIs, I'm going to call them KPIs, key performance indicators, are broken into to three distinct categories. They're called, um, in, in the little, little anagram that we used um, in the book was, was MOM, M-O-M. So it's money, occupancy, and, and management. So make sure that you always are taking care of MOM. That's the key when you're, when you're, um, when you're uh, asset managing apartment indication deals, making sure you're taking care of MOM. Uh, we're actually going to give away a free document with a series. It's going to be at least one free document. Um, as of now, it's going to be a weekly performance review template. So it's going to have a um, it's going to have the the money, the occupancy, and the management um, KPIs. So specifically, what we track for money, specifically what we track for occupancy, and specifically what we track for for management in order to to, to determine in order to confirm that we are on track with our business plan. So your the goal would be to send this. Um, tracker to your management company and have them fill it out each week and then send it to you before your call. And then the, the purpose of the call is to review the, the, the KPIs. And I guess on a, on a monthly basis, the meeting might be a little bit longer. If you were a, if you were, if you did identify some discrepancies in that uh, monthly financial document. So it's really quickly, uh, let's I'm going to go over these, um, these moms, um, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly kind of define any of these terms, but uh, we've, we've if you go all the way back to the Master the Lingo episode, we've, we've, we've kind of exhaustively gone over uh, what all of these terms mean and provided examples of, of each of them. But I'll, 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 I'll do my best to explain them now as well. So for money, there's, there's five different uh, KPIs we're looking at. Number one is the, the gross potential income. So that is how much money would the property bring in if all units were rented at market rates. And then there's the, the gross occupied income, which is the, the actual income. So not how much money could we be bringing in if we assumed all units were occupied, all occupied, but how much money are we bringing in based off of the units that are currently occupied? So this is kind of like an, an economic income. Next is uh, how much money was actually collected that, that week. 
Next is the, the month to date collected and the month to date delinquent. So obviously the, 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 the week might let you know if you're, if you're short or, or high that week, but the month to date collected is most likely going to be more important because you want to make sure that you're hitting that collection number each month. And obviously if you aren't, then the difference between what you should be getting and what you're actually getting is going to be that, that delinquent. So if there is a lot of money delinquent, you want to know why. And you want to know what your property management company is doing to, to make sure that they are going to be able to actually collect that, that money. So that's the, the money. Next is the, the occupancy. So a few things you're going to want to know. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different KPIs for, for this. Number one is the number of units that are pre-leased. So these are, so these are units that are either vacant currently or have a lease expiring at the end of the month and they are, are already um, leased by, by a new resident. You want to know number of notices that were given this week, so eviction notices, so you know how many people are going, you know, of that overall occupancy, how many of those are actually going to be gone by the end of the month. And then you want to know the total number of notices you have on the book. So obviously, if I send out an eviction the first week of the month and they're not leaving until the end of the month, then you know week three that notice is not going to be accounted for and the notice is given that week. So you want to know how many of those um, are actually going to be evicted. Evicted. Next is the number of set outs scheduled. And next is the, is the number of applications you had denied just to make sure that your private management company are getting qualified leads. Next are the number of renewals. So of the leases that are expiring, how many of those residents have actually renewed the lease for a new 12-month term? Um, and then lastly, the number of people on the, the waiting list. So ideally, you've got a waiting list because your property is in such demand that you've got a list of, of people who want to move in so that if you have to do you know an eviction or if someone is moving out just because their lease ends, you've already got a list of pre-qualified people that you can um, lease that unit to. That's occupancy. And then next is going to be management, which is a whole lot of... of um, of KPIs for management. First is going to be the current occupancy rate percentage, so pretty self-explanatory, what percentage of the units are occupied. Next is the total number of occupied units this week. So obviously if you've got you know, a 10% vacancy, 10% vacancy rate, um, how many of those units are, 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 are um, going to be occupied or were occupied that week? Also, you want the total number of occupied units from the prior week as well. Um, plus total number of move-ins, so who all moved in last week how many new tenants moved in the previous week um and then what are the what's next is what's the projected total number of occupied units and then the projected occupancy percentage so this is like a pre-leased so you've got your current occupancy which is today but as i mentioned before you've got some units that are pre-leased you've got some people who are going to be be renewing um and then you also got, also got people who are going to move who are going to be moving out for some reason or another so you want to know what is the projected occupancy by the the end of the month um, and so that's covered by the total occupied units projected and the projected occupancy percentage. Next is the number of evictions filed, number of skips, number of transfers. Um, so skips are when people skip out, so they're supposed to be moving in, but they, for some reason, just don't move in on that date. Number of transfers is pretty explanatory. I'm moving from you know unit 1 to unit 10. Um, number of units that are currently vacant. And then of those vacant units, how many of them are rent ready and how many of them are not rent ready? So there's really no set. You know, I mean, for some of these, there's a specific you know, number you projected. So for the current occupancy, um, you need to kind of have an idea of how many of you know, what, what you want your occupancy rate to be. But there's really no um, you know, absolute, hey, if I have this many evictions filed, then you know, I'm, I'm, having, I'm having an issue. It's more of a, a something you want to track. So if you're having... If you have 10 evictions one week and then eight the next week, you're trending positively. But if you've got you know, two evictions and then four and then six and then eight and then 10, something's going on. And so this is more of a, if you want to track the trends. And so ideally all of these are trending in that, that positive direction. And um, so which means either, you know, for example, the number of units that are vacant trending positively would mean the number of vacant units are actually decreasing. Or if the number of skips, you want that to be as close to zero as, as possible. So that's mom. Um, as I mentioned, we're gonna get, we're gonna go ahead and give away that a free document. So all of those those um those KPIs will be in the spreadsheet we're giving away. So you can just send that to your management company. Maybe you know add some add some colors to it, add your logo to it, customize it however you see fit. See fit, 
add or subtract certain KPIs based off of your, your, your business plan and the types of things that you want to track, and then go ahead and send that to your management company. One last note on the weekly performance reviews. And I, pretty, and, and I mentioned this in the, uh, the syndication school episode when we were talking about how to actually qualify and interview a private management company is you want to set expectations for these reviews. So you don't want to you know, not really say anything to your management company about these reviews and then when you close, say, hey, by the way, I want to schedule a weekly call with you and I want you to fill out this template each week and I want you to send me the financials each month Right, you want all the you want to um, set expectations for all of that up front. So obviously, not you know during the, the first conversation with the management company, you don't want to have a list of all these things you need them to do. But just mention, hey, um, you know, we um, once we actually close on the deal, can we do weekly calls? And they say, yeah, sure. And then once you actually find a deal, say, hey, you know, on these weekly calls, here's what we want to do. You know, are you still on board with that? And they say no. Well, then you either need to, you know not do that, but you're going to want to do that. So you might need to find another management company or figure out a way to kind of um, work with them in order to, to get that, that data. So that's number two, weekly performance reviews. The third asset management duty is going to be the investor distributions. So you paying your investors. So whatever uh, frequency you determine, whether that's monthly, quarterly, or annual basis, you're going to need to send out the correct distributions to your investors. So whatever that preferred return is that you offer to your investors, you need to, you need to distribute that to your investors you know, each month, each quarter, each each year, um, by the, the day that you set out in your investor guide, which we talked about in the previous series. That's the, the guide that you know, talks about timing of distributions and other other important um, information to your, that communicates that to your investors in that in that closing email. Ideally, your private management company handles these distributions um, with your oversight. So since they're the one that's since they're the ones that are collecting the money, they should also be the ones that are sending the, the money out. So however your company, however however your investors want to receive their returns, whether that's through the direct deposit or a monthly check, make sure again you set expectations with your private management company and let them know, hey, can uh, I I want to send out monthly distributions either through check or through direct deposit is that something you're capable of doing they might say yeah sure they might say oh well we only want to do direct deposit and we need to do it quarterly all right so negotiation if you want if you, if you if they say they can only do it quarterly and that's okay with you then do it quarterly if not then you might need to find another management company or you know figure out a way to negotiate those those monthly distributions and ask them what you can do to help them uh, make that happen so that is number three Number four is actually investor communications. Um, we're going to skip that one for now because that's very detailed. And so we're going to start next week, next um, tomorrow's episode by talking about the ongoing investor communications. Um, so for the um, implementing the business plan and the weekly performance reviews, those are likely going to be um, um, those duties are going to be the responsibilities of whoever is responsible for asset management. So whoever that asset manager is will be on those weekly calls. And we'll be focused on implementing the business plan, reviewing the reviewing the financials each month, having that conversation with the management company if there are any discrepancies. Investor distributions um, can either be managed by the um, asset manager or the person who's responsible for ongoing investor communications or whoever your money raiser is, just because this is not really something that you're you know, the, the person who's sending out the distributions aren't. I mean, they're kind of interfacing. With the investors because they're sending out the distributions, but right they're, they're, there's no really conversation about that. It's more of they look at their bank account and the money's in there or it's not in there, or they open up their mailbox and the check's in there or the check's not in there. Um, and then obviously, if they don't have if they don't have the correct distribution, they're going to reach out to the money raiser and say, "Hey, what's going on with this distribution?" At which point they can either reach out to the management company or they can tell the the asset manager because the asset manager is the one who's going to be in frequent communication with the the property manager. Number four is one that's going to be the responsibility of both parties, um, but we'll get more into the investor communication uh, later uh, tomorrow, as I mentioned. Um, number five, and this is the last thing we'll talk about today, and we'll go through, um, you know, I guess four and then six through the rest uh, tomorrow. So number five is managing the renovations. So if you're a value add apartments indicator or a distressed indicator, or even if you're a turnkey syndicator, there's most you're likely going to have 
some sort of renovation you're going to do to the property, whether that's interior or, or exterior or just upgrading some amenity. So the asset manager is going to be responsible for making sure those renovations are done at, co- at, the, at the right cost and on, on time. Um, there's really two ways that these renovations get funded. They're either funded out of the capital that was raised or they're funded by, by the bank. If they're funded by the money that was, was raised and you have a bank account and the money kind of comes out of there to pay the, the contractors and pay for the supplies. But if you did a some sort of renovation loan where these renovation costs were included in your, your financing, then there's going to be extra, extra responsibility, which is having that constant communication with the, the lender during the renovation um, period. Because um, typically how it works is you're not going to get like a lump sum, you know, dollar amount up front. So if your renovations are $10 million, you're not going to get a check for $10 million at, at closing. Um, it's going to be more of a, it's going to, it's going to be based off of, of draws from the bank based off of your, your, your budget and your CapEx timeline that you provided to the lender before closing. So you're going to need, you're going to interact with someone at the bank in order to, to make sure you're getting those, those construction draws so you can pay for those CapEx X projects. And typically, you know, your general contractor and your private management company should know how you know beforehand one that you're getting a, a renovation loan, and 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 two, they should have an idea of how that process works because again, you're hiring a private management company who has experience repositioning these these types of, of properties. So, in reality, you're you're managing the the people who are managing the renovations because ideally, your property management company is the one that's doing the day to day work. You're just making sure you know each week that they are on track. And if your renovations are not included in the actual budget and you're covering the costs out of the, the money you raise from your investors, then you've got a lot more control on when you can get projects done and when you can pay people for doing those projects. And you don't have to have that extra responsibility of, of going back and forth with the, the lender. We're gonna go over one more actually, so we're gonna do number six. And so we'll do five, we'll do four, and then seven through ten tomorrow. Number six is the asset manager is responsible for maintaining the economic occupancy. So once you once the, once you've taken over the property, obviously you're gonna begin implementing your value added business plan, which requires performing renovations both interior and exterior. So if you remember during the underwriting, we accounted for a higher vacancy rate or a lower economic occupancy rate during the renovation period, which would be the first 12 to 24 months, depending on the level of, of renovation. But even though you're projecting a, a lower number, that doesn't mean you can just not think about occupancy at all during the renovations, right? You still want to make sure that you're hitting that projected number. So if it was 8%, then you make sure that each month, your, or each, each you know, technically each week, your occupancy is not dropping below 92%. If you project 10%, the number is 90%. And uh, we're going to go over in a, um, in a in a future episode specifically how to maintain the economic occupancy um, with a whole list of, of ways to, to essentially bring in high quality tenants. Where a high quality tenant is someone who pays on time and actually stays in the property, takes care of it, resigns the lease. Um, but you know, if you don't hit your occupancy number, your economic occupancy goal, then you're not going to hit your return goals either. Which means you can't distribute your money to your investors. Now, ideally, this is not solely reliant. This uh, this is uh, this is not solely the responsibility of the asset manager. Like all of these responsibilities, your property management company should be involved and should be implementing the best practices. So, for this particular duty, your property management company should be implementing the best practices for maintaining that economic occupancy rate through advertising, marketing, um, adjusting, you know, making sure they're adjusting rental rates properly. But you are the asset manager or your partner is the asset man- manager. So it's your, it's your responsibility to, to oversee and advise your management company. Specifically, you need to let them know how quickly you want the renovations to be made at and making sure that they can actually do the renovations, right? So you don't want to f- say, hey, I want to do 30 renovations a month. And they're like, well, we can only do 10. And you say, well, no, well, I'm going to force you to do 30, right? You don't want to do that. Um, you need to make sure that you are adhering to their abilities. Um, so you don't want to be, you don't want to force them to do renovations too quickly. You don't want to be too aggressive with the pace you do renovations either. 
um, right? So you don't want to go in there with a plan of doing 10 a month and then all of a sudden, you know, deciding you want to do 15 to 20 a month, right? So stick to whatever your your pre-approved renovation plan and budgets were based off of your conversation with your management company, as well as your pre-approved rental premiums that you specified during the underwriting and the due diligence phase. Now, before we wrap up, a quick note on how to actually renovate units, right? Because you're buying a property, if you're a value-add investor, you're buying a property that's already stabilized. So the, so the occupancy rate is you know, 85% plus. So obviously you can renovate those 15 vacant units pretty quickly um, or ones that are you know going to be turned over within within the end of the month. But what about the other units, right? You, 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 you most likely don't want to wait until the end, uh, you know, for those 85 units, you don't want to wait for all those leases to expire to actually ma- renovate the unit. So here are a few tricks, a few strategies to um, to, to renovate your your units at a, at a faster pace without having to wait for them to the, the leases to to naturally end. So one would be once you've renovated those 15% vacant units in our example, then you can offer those newly renovated units to a resident who currently lives in a non-renovated unit so that you can renovate their their unit, right? So we've got so if you can technically transfer 15% of your unrenovated unit to uh, unit uh, tenants to the 15% that are now newly renovated and then do those next 15% and then continue that on until you've done all of the units. Obviously in combination with a few other strategies. Um, you can also um, increase the rents on the unrenovated units to promote turnover. So for example, if a lease were to expire and the person just wants to re-sign their lease, you can um, increase their rent by whatever your projected rental premium is. So let's say you plan on spending 10 grand in a unit and raise a rent by 150 bucks. Then if someone who's living in an unrenovated unit's lease expires, you can raise their rent by 150. If they accept it, then great. You've got essentially $10,000 worth of work for free. If they don't and they move out, then you can renovate that unit. But obviously you don't want to have a, a large influx of vacant unrenovated, unrenovated units. Or and, then, and if you do, don't feel like you have to renovate every single one of them, right? So if you take over and then, you know, 15% of the people's lease expires and they and you know you say, hey, I'm raising rent by 150 bucks and they leave, don't feel like you have to renovate all 15% of the units. Just make sure you stick to your plan. So if you're going to only renovate, let's say, you know, half of them, then that's, you know, ha- you renovate half of them and then lease the rest back and then renovate those um, in the next 12 months. Another uh, strategy is to renovate the units while someone's currently living there. And the way to sell that is you say, hey, we're going to renovate your unit um, and you will get the, the new upgraded unit for, for really no cost to, to you. And um, this really depends on, on, on the, the level of renovation, but you know you can do it while they're at work, basically. Um, if you want to, you can even put them up in a, in a, in a hotel. Um, you know, I, I know, you know you, if, if something crazy happens at a unit from a maintenance issue perspective, you, you, know, you can put people up in, in hotels. Um, again, these are just ideas. Uh, it's really up to you and, and what your budget um, allows. So one is just renovate them as people move out. Two is offer a newly renovated unit to someone who's already living there for you know a small upcharge or even for free. Three would be to um, renovate the units um, while someone is actually uh, living there. And then four would be to increase the rent on a non-renovated unit so that you promote some, some turnover. And again, if you have you know 100 vacant units, don't feel like you have to renovate all 100 of, of those and you know... 10 a month for 10 months, you've got all these vacant units sitting there. It's okay to, you know, if you've got five or six, for every five or six units that become vacant, you renovate only half of them and then at least the remaining units back to the market unrenovated and then catch them on the next next cycle. Um, as long as your, your, your plan was to renovate these property, these units over, you know, a 24 month period. Um, overall, you want to renovate at a pace that will not adversely affect your occupancy rate. Plus, it will not make your property management company go insane. <laughs> right? So it needs to be based off of what you and your property management company agree to. So those are five of the 10 top asset management duties. Uh, just to review, number one is implement the business plan. Number two is the weekly per- performance reviews, and we gave away that free weekly performance review document. Three is investor distributions. Four is the investor communications, which we're going over tomorrow. 
So, um, you know, the real four is managing renovations, and then five is maintaining economic occupancy. In part two, we're going to go over the, the, the last um, five top asset management duties, so that's six through ten. In the meantime, make sure you check out the other syndication school series that we have about the how-tos of apartment syndications and download that free weekly performance review tracker. All of that can be found at syndicationschool.com. Thank you for listening and I'll talk to you tomorrow.